Thank you. All right. So we were in Romans chapter one. We last week we were looking at the significance of Jesus being the, the son of David. And uh, we looked at a few verses there that the one that we didn't get to, which is maybe the most profound is Revelation twenty two sixteen, where Jesus said, I am the root and the offspring of David. Um, significance of that is he's not just David's offspring. He's not just the son of David, but he's the root of David. He's the, the creator. He's David came from him. So it's, uh, you know, again, it's just reinforcing his dual nature, his divine nature and his human nature. He's the root of David. He's the creator. He's also the the offspring of David. He's the son of David through the flesh, through through Mary, and also through Joseph um, legally. And uh, we we talked a little bit last time about Jesus being the firstborn. I forget which scripture we were looking at, but there's there's at least. I don't know, it must be a half a dozen places in the New Testament where it talks about Jesus being the firstborn. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn of creation. And we just kind of briefly scratched the surface on that. What, what, anybody have any insights on that? What it means that Jesus is the firstborn? I know there's some uh, that say, whenever it says Jesus is the firstborn from creation, they use that to try to say, oh, that means Jesus is just a created being. But it's obviously, I mean, if you just, well, that's in Colossians 1. If you just read a couple of verses further, it's clear that Jesus is not a created being because it says he's the firstborn of creation. Let's see, where is it? Colossians 1, 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created. So if he's the creator of all things, you know, how could he be a created being? But, so they take that, they stop where it says he's the firstborn of all creation and say, oh, that means he's a created being. But obviously he's not because he's the creator. All things were created by him in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. So I think that gives us a clue on what it means that he's the firstborn of creation. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things in him. All things hold together. He is the head of the body. So I think it, that firstborn, when he's the firstborn of creation, I think it's just saying that he's the preeminent one. He's he's the the one. He's the author of creation. He's the um, I don't know what how else would you put it. Gives him priority, rank. He's he's above creation. He's he's the place of, has the place of preeminence. Um, anybody have any other thoughts on that? You look at Psalm 89, God says, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. So it just it's just giving him a, a position of preeminence when he's called the firstborn. Any any insights, Dad? Jeff, you have any thoughts on that? Well, of course you think about um, you know, you think about um the firstborn in in Genesis, right, um, was um, different, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I don't know if you can link them. I mean, um, can you really say that um, that uh, when you think about the twins, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think God doesn't love based on our priority in terms of human accomplishment i think i think that you know god's concept of firstborn is um the only begotten son of god right does that make sense yeah yeah and and the firstborn is not necessarily the one that was you know quote firstborn it's it's not necessarily birth order so much as as uh prominence or preeminence um but yeah yeah i mean i can i could i could see it that way but um sure mm -hmm. but um yeah i would i'm a little rusty but mm -hmm. uh it's been a couple of weeks mm -hmm. but uh yeah i would i would say that um 
you know, really there's there's two things in Romans 1, 4, right? There's the idea that um, Jesus being born physically of um, David's line mm -hmm. and then of him being declared to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Amen. So firstborn among the dead may refer to that. In fact, some say that his ministry changed entirely after uh, after the the resurrection, mm. right? That he was before the crucifixion, that it was his earthly ministry, but then it was sort of the ministry of the spirit afterwards, you know, because mm. the Holy Spirit yeah. raised him from the dead, I think is the implication. Right. Yeah. And, and then Second Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the ministry of the spirit. It contrasts it with the uh, ministry of the letter, the, the ministry of death, ministry of condemnation versus the ministry of life, ministry of the spirit. So, yeah. And uh, so, OK. All right. Because it says he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of interesting because. Christ appeals to the, the Jews, right? The the mess, the Messiah, and mm. Lord appeals to the Gentiles. Mm. So, using that title kind of yeah, involves everyone. I think mm. that, that's a good Jew point. And Gentile. Yeah. Uh, well, I think of Peter's first sermon there in at Pentecost on Acts Acts chapter two, where he says where he says to the people, he's talking to the men of Israel, he says, know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he, he, he makes both titles, both Lord and Christ, Messiah and Lord. So yeah, that's an interesting point, Jeff. <clears throat> Appealing to Jews and Gentiles alike. And when that, of course, you know, Romans, we're going to see throughout the book of Romans, the appeal to both Jews and Gentiles, the, the whole the first 11 chapters it you, you'll keep seeing Jews and Gentiles alike, the circumcision and the uncircumcision, those under the law, those without the law. It's re referring to both Jews and Gentiles. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah, so down to verse four. You know, Jesus, how was Jesus declared to be the son of God? It was with power with power through the through the resurrection from the dead that 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 should do it don't you think Re, res, resurrect being resurrected from the dead would would declare him to be son of god with power that's resurrection power of course that same power that raised jesus from the dead is now living in us um there it says according to the spirit of holiness of course we would consider that to be the holy spirit that is uh, the spirit of holiness would be the Holy Spirit. Um, several different places where it says Jesus was raised by the Father, it says he was raised by God, it says he was raised by the Holy Spirit. It also said he raised himself. So the you know you see the whole Trinity being involved in the in the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, yeah, I was, I was thinking about that the other day. <clears throat> <clears throat> you know, remember in John chapter two, Jesus says, if you uh, destroy this temple, I, I will raise it up again in three days. And you think also, well, and, and then in John 10, when he said, nobody takes my life from me, I lay it down and I take it up again. And you think, you know, okay, how, how did Jesus do that? If he's dead, <clears throat> excuse me, if Jesus is dead. How could he raise himself from the dead? But but then you know, got to thinking about it, you know, how what what does it mean to be dead? You know, like like James chapter two says, the body without the spirit is dead. So to be dead, his his body was dead, meaning it was separated from the spirit. Remember when he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, into, into your hands I commend my spirit. So his body, he died physically, his body went into the grave, but his spirit went to be with the father. So if Jesus raised himself from the dead, it would be his spirit, right? That And that's what it says right there, the spirit of holiness. Whether you want to say that's the spirit of Christ or the spirit of, of God or the Holy Spirit, God is one. So 
Um, yeah, it was the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ raising himself, God raising him. Anybody have any other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, well, yeah, that one, that brings another thought to mind about, you know, about what it means to be spiritually dead. You know, when, when we're physically dead, it means that our spirit and our body are separated. When we're spiritually dead, our, our spirit is separated from God's spirit. It, it's, you know, death, death is really, it's, it's separation, isn't it? It's either, if it's physical death, it's separation from the body and spirit. If it's spiritual death, it's separation from God's spirit and our spirit. And once we're born again, we become alive, raised, we're made alive together with Christ. Our spirit is joined with his spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and, and dwells in us. So that's what spiritual life is, being our spirit, being united with God's spirit. Spiritual death is our spirit being separated from God's spirit. And uh, is it is it First Corinthians where, where Paul says, whoever has joined himself with the Lord is one spirit with him. So, you know, life, spiritual life is having our spirit joined with his spirit. Spiritual death is our spirit separated from his spirit. Uh, is that making sense? All right. Um, so then verse five says, what, what did Paul say we've received through him? We've received through Christ. It says through him, that's through Christ, that's through the Son of God, we've received grace and apostleship. So we talked about this a little bit that first week about apostleship. Who is he referring to when Paul says we've received apostleship? Is he re referring to all believers or is he referring to just himself and the other 11? Referring to himself and and Barnabas? Uh, who, who do you think he's referring to there? Who has received apostleship? We know we all, all have received grace. That's Everybody who's a believer, actually, even unbelievers have received grace to some degree. Anybody have any thoughts on that? What who's he referring to when he says we've received apostleship? Well, I think he's been he's saying that he's been set apart mm -hmm. for the gospel of Christ. All right. And um I also think that um I thought I had another thought. Maybe not. Well, I mean, he's, he's, this whole first part is about the gospel, right? Right. And, and the nature of the gospel. I, I have it broken down in, in one thing to, you know, that, um, in a minute, that, uh, okay, so oh, this is the interesting part. He calls himself a slave, mm -hmm. doulos, right? Mm -hmm. Which is utter humility. Mm -hmm. And then apostle, which is anything but, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so it's just an interesting contrast. But what I think he's saying is that the origin of the gospel is God. This is how it's phrased up. Mm -hmm. And that's how it begins. And someone said that uh, God is the most important word in this entire epistle, which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting. It's a book about God, right? It's sure. probably where most of our theology comes from. But the attestation of the gospel, the scripture, he says that in verse two, mm -hmm. right? But then the substance of the gospel is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's really, in my mind, sort of a beautiful presentation of what the gospel is. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Um, and of course, apostleship, that, that, to be an apostle means that you've been sent. So you've been divinely appointed and sent. So you know, through Christ, that's where he received his apostleship. Christ is the one who appointed him and sent him, um, whether he's referring to just the, the 12 or I don't know. In one sense, we've all been sent, but not in the same, probably not in the same uh, sense as an, as an apostle. Because there were uh, specific requirements to be considered an apostle, you had to witness had been had been a 
been with Jesus, witnessed him in person, his his resurrection, you have to be able to have there were signs that healings and so forth that the apostles performed. That's in uh let's see where all is that? that's in oh first Corinthians that's spe that's spelled out. Um anyway, but is we've that, all yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Does that imply that Paul witnessed the crucifixion or the resurrection or something. Um, I guess the resurrection would be on the road to Emmaus, but uh, you know he was he was kind of a latter day apostle. So I'm just wondering um, what you think about his qualifications under that definition of apostleship. Yeah, because he considers himself as one untimely born. He says I'm not even worth worthy of being called an apostle because I persecuted the church. She said, I'm the least of the apostles. So yeah, I don't I don't know how I mean there's controversy. Was it, you know, is Paul the twelfth or is it Matthias? Um, I don't know. We could debate that, but um but yet there are places where he he calls himself an apostle, where there's places where Barnabas is called an apostle. Barnabas wasn't one of the twelve either. So um yeah, there were there are, and we know from Revelation that there are the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So apparently, yeah, there are other apostles besides the twelve of the Lamb, evidently. Um, In my translation, he's not really calling himself an apostle so much as saying God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles. Well, good um, point. Hmm? Yeah, good good point. Yeah, Paul. I, yeah, I I. I misspoke as soon as i said that i thought well that wasn't the right way to say that but yeah you're right paul doesn't call himself apostle he's he's says he's a called apostle or he's called as an apostle however your translation puts it yeah yeah it wasn't wasn't the title that he gave himself yeah i apologize if i'm if i no 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 misspoke. he's chosen you're right in the beginning he's chosen by god to be an apostle right and he calls himself a slave of christ jesus you know, yeah, sent out to preach his good news. So, I think uh, I think that's the key there that he's sent to preach the good news. Amen, amen. That was that was the purpose. That's that was that's what his apostleship was all about. To go out, set apart for the gospel. To go, out. he was sent, appointed by Jesus, sent to preach the gospel. That that was his life. To he said me to live as Christ, to die as gain. I determined to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. So yeah, that was that was his apostleship was to go out and preach the gospel. Well, he makes that clear in verse five. Um, he says we've pre we've received apostleship, and here's the purpose. Here's the reason for it. We've received apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for His name's sake. So that was the purpose of his apostleship to to proclaim this gospel so that the Gentiles can believe. They can hear about Christ, and they can believe the obedience of faith so they can obey the gospel um for, uh second second thessalonians chapter one talks about the those that that don't obey the gospel they're gonna experience the the wrath of, of christ when he returns so the obedience is the obedience to the gospel the obedience of faith um, bring, brings to mind Hebrews chapter three, where it talks about the evil heart of unbelief, and and it it relates obedience and faith almost as synonymous. Talks about uh, let's see Hebrews, the end of Hebrews chapter three, he talks about verse twelve talks about the evil heart of unbelief, and then down in verse, let's see. Uh, Verse 17, about those that in the wilderness who sinned. And then uh, verse 18, they should not enter because they're disobedient, because they were disobedient. And then it says they were not able to enter because of unbelief. So, you know, obedience, be belief and obedience go hand in hand. If if we don't believe, we're not going to obey. If we if we do believe, we're, we're going to tend to obey. It's the two go hand in hand like that one 
song, trust and obey. There's no other way. So the obedience of the gospel, the obedience of faith. All right. And then Paul, of course, he was Paul was known as the apostle to the Gentiles. There's at least five places in his epistles where he calls himself the apostle to the Gentiles. Also in Acts, Acts chapter nine talks about being apostle to the Gentiles. And, and in Acts 13, where he was Acts 13, he was preaching in the synagogues to the Jews, and they he says, You judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. He said, Now I'm gonna go to the Gentiles. So that was in Acts 13. So his apostleship was so the Gentiles would believe, would have the obedience of faith for his namesake. And of course, his namesake is, is Jesus. All right, he was given grace. And so, so what is grace? How would you define grace when if you were telling a, a lost person about, about grace, you're saved by grace? How how would you describe that to a lost person? If you had to tell a lost person they're saved by grace, what would you tell them grace is? All you have to do is just believe. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. Okay. There's only one Savior. Amen. One Savior. You can't save yourself. It's not something we can deserve or earn. God's God's undeserved favor, His kindness towards us. Just trust Him. Don't trust yourself. Your good works aren't going to do it. So it's... Yeah, little little acronym you've probably heard, Grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. Nothing we can talk about. It's a free gift. We're justified freely as a gift by his grace. Chapter three. It's a gift. Uh, Roman, when we get to chapter five, talk about receiving grace and the gift of righteousness. All right. And then apostleship, we talked about that already. Um, yes, first Corinthians nine is where Paul says, I'm where the Lord appeared to me, and I'm the least of the apostles. So he's he's seen the Lord. That was one of the requirements. And he talked to the Corinthians, said, You are my seal of apostleship. The Corinthians were his seal of apostleship. Perhaps they're coming to faith in, in Christ. They believe the gospel, so that made them the, the seal of his apostle, the authenticity that of his apostleship, planning that church. Second uh, Corinthians 12 talks about the signs and wonders that an apostle will, will uh, perform, carries the authority of the one who sent him. And in Hebrews... Let's see, where is it? Hebrews uh, 3 says that Jesus is our apostle and great high priest. Um, perhaps that's referring to the Father sending him. He was Jesus was the one sent by the Father, so maybe that's what that's referring to as Jesus being our apostle. Anybody have any thoughts on that, how Jesus is our apostle? I'm, I'm assuming it would be because he was sent by the Father. Sent by the Father to seek and save that which was lost. Came with the Father's full authority. All right. Um, and then let's see, verse six. Who's Paul writing to? Writing to you who are the called of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? What's it mean to be the called, the called of Jesus Christ? Whenever I think of the called, I always think of Matthew 22 with the parable of the wedding banquet where the king said he had a wedding prepared. He went out to 
all those that were invited, which would have been the, the Jews, and they, they rejected the offer, and then he went out to said, go out into the highways and byways, anybody you see, which would be all the Gentiles. Some of them came, some didn't. And then uh, finally there was someone that came that was not wearing the wedding clothes and said, how did you get in? And he cast them out into outer darkness. That's, and he finishes that with many are called, but few are chosen. And of course, the ones that are chosen are the ones that come wearing the, the wedding clothes, which is Christ's righteousness. So, so that always comes to mind when I think of being called, called or chosen. Many are called, but only a few are chosen. In that case, he was calling everyone, every, anybody in the highways and byways. Go ahead, Rob. You have something to add? Well, that's just what I was going to say. I was good. It seems to me like the call is every single person. I mean, there's a big difference between that and being chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, I, I I would say it's everyone has been called according to Matthew twenty two. Um, now you could say there's you know a difference in the in the type of call. Some are called to to preach. Some are called to be apostles. Some are called for different roles. But as far as for salvation, um, I I'd say it's and I, and I know there's some disagreement on that, but I I'd say it's fair to say. From Matthew 22, that, that everyone has been called. The, the gospel goes out to everyone. Well, that, that would probably put you at odds with Reformed theology a bit. It would. Because they would say that God's calling is effectual. Right. In other words, only, uh, he only calls those who are chosen. Right. It's not, um, it's not. So I don't know if that's wrong or right. I mean, what, yeah. what you said suggested that uh, uh, of course that's a long-standing point of dissension between yeah. different camps but um, you know I, I think the Holy Spirit has to work in your heart or you can't even hear yeah. what God is trying to tell you I mean that's based on my own salvation yeah. um, experience but um, are there others yes there may be some who um hear the word who've been touched by the Holy Spirit. And uh, I mean, there's indications of this. I think even in Romans, right? Maybe mm -hmm. Romans 6 that, you know, that um, um, if you turn away from that calling, mm -hmm. you, you know, can't be, you can't be saved again. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I guess the whole idea of perseverance comes in there somewhere, mm -hmm. but it, this, this whole, this whole epistle, tends to lead you into some contemplation of reformed theology. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that there are certainly uh, different views on that. Yeah. All right. Um, so, let's see. Verses six through seven. Um so he's talking to those that are called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God. So he's talking to the beloved. So who are the beloved? How did you become beloved? And why are we beloved? Is it, is it, was there something about us that was lovable? What does it mean to be beloved? Well, that's a mystery, I think. You know, yeah. Jacob and um, Esau, he mm -hmm. said, uh, I have loved Jacob, but hated Esau. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, why? Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. explanation in terms yeah. of their behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're, we're beloved and, and beloved, the, the word there, it's, it's, uh, it's a form of agape. I don't know how you pronounce that. But it's it's a it's a form of agape, which is God's uh, unconditional love. It's His sacrificial love. It's not based on the the lovability of the one being loved. It's because of God's nature. He He chooses to love us because God is love. 
it's it's you know it's uh, Romans five eight while we were sinners he loved us so it's he demonstrated on the cross by dying for our sins that's a sacrificial agape love so yes yeah, not because of anything lovable about us it's because of God's nature. I think it's pronounced agavatos, something like that. That that's probably right. I didn't want to uh, butcher it, so I. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have no such uh, reservations. <laughs> but yeah, that that sounds that I'll go with that. That's that'll with the spelling. I got. I'll, how did you pronounce it? Agabat, uh, agape toast. I don't know. Agape toast. Agape yeah. toast. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's a form of agape. Uh, yep. So he loved us even while we were enemies. So how much more must he love us what, now that we're his children? We're, we're his saints. It says we're called. It said we're called as saints. We're called saints. And of course, a saint, What what's that? That's a, that's a holy one, right? Same Same thing as being a holy one or being sanctified or set apart we're we're called saints we didn't we didn't earn sainthood we we were declared to be saints uh hebrews 10 10 we have been sanctified through the offering of, of the body of jesus once and for all it's because of what jesus did that, that we're saints even even the corinthians paul writes his letter to the corinthians Corinthians addresses them as saints and their behavior was anything but saintly. So it's a, it means that you're a holy one means you've been set apart for God's purposes. Similar to what he's saying here. He said, I he said, I was set apart for the gospel. If, if you're a saint, you're a holy one. You've been set apart for God's purposes. And that one of those purposes is to, to, for the gospel, proclaim the gospel. We're, we're, we're set apart for his purposes to be different. All right. So, and how did you become a saint? How did we become saints? I, uh, out of ignorance, I thought you could only sainthood was achieved after life. Uh, okay. Like, I didn't think you could achieve sainthood on earth. Okay. I would say sanctification by the Holy Spirit, which is incomplete in this life, to Rob's point. It's only when we're glorified in glory mm -hmm. that um, we, you know, it's sort of what C.S. Lewis said about, you know, there are people walking around now and you see them. And if you saw them when they'd reached the end of the road, you would be amazed, you know, you mm -hmm. would see people that are either beautiful beyond belief because they're God's own saints. Mm -hmm. It's it's really our eyes and and this mortal life that keeps us from seeing clearly what each other, what we really are. Mm -hmm. So there are other people in this world that if you saw them, you'd be horrified, be yeah. like something like a nightmare when they reach their final condition. So I uh, can't remember where that is exactly, but I know C.S. Lewis said words to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're not fully known as saints by one another yet, that we can't imagine. But the fact that we're in Christ gives us, through a glass darkly, some, some mm -hmm. intimation of what we'll be someday. Mm -hmm. So you're equating sainthood with our behavior? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, I, I see it as a process beginning with sanctification. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say that sainthood begins with justification. Mm -hmm. Once we're justified, we're saints. I don't know. How do you read that? Well, okay. Um, well, he's, let's see. What did he say there? He says, um, he's, he's writing to you who are, are the called, you who are beloved, who are called saints. So he's saying you're, you're called saints. Um, holy ones, those that are sanctified. 
And Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 10 says, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. We have been declared to be holy. We have been declared to be saints. He, even in, uh, in Corinthians, he says, I'm writing to, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified. You have been sanctified, saints by calling. So he's said, you have been sanctified by Christ. You are saints by calling. You're, you said, didn't say you're saints because of your behavior. He said you're saints by calling. So we're called saints because we have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. So we've been set apart. We've been declared to be holy. We are called saints. That so then that term has just been kind of homogenized by by our culture to mean something that it's is really a lot more than what it's what it was originally intended i guess right and yeah because there are there's a major uh if you want to call it a religion or denomination that doesn't declare that that where their their leader declares whether or not someone is a saint and that's after they're they're died and they and they use qualifications that are not based on yeah. scripture. They use qualifications like you had to have uh, has to be a testable miracles and so forth and you had to have achieved a certain level of uh, piety or but scripture doesn't doesn't put that kind of a qualification it, you have just have to have been sanctified by christ called as a saint or called a saint so it's it's based on bless you it's based on the the work of christ on the cross and and our our faith in in his grace so so in your definition jim is there a difference between justification and sanctification or are they equal? Well, according to this, if we're sanctified, if, if we're sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all, it's because of what Christ has done, right? So it's it's one time to be to be a saint is to be set apart. We we were set apart the moment we believed in Christ, were we not? Isn't that when, that's when we were justified, that's when we were declared righteous, and that's also when we were set apart. Now, our behavior, that's, you know, we're going to grow in grace, where to, Peter says, we're to be holy as, as he is holy, so we're to live that out, but as far as being a saint, being set apart, that's, I see that as once and done, but, but we, we grow in that. We we live that out then. Because I have been set apart, I'm going to live a life that's different. I want to uh, fulfill the the purposes for which God set me apart. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, um, I, I, I've tended at least to think of there as being, you know, these three phases of Christian life. One is justification mm -hmm. when you accept Christ. Mm -hmm. through grace and two is the work of the holy spirit transforming you mm -hmm. into the image and likeness mm -hmm. of christ all will talk about at length in romans right. Being conformed, the image of christ might be <clears throat> sanctification and then glorification is being removed from the presence of sin right and eternity with christ so i don't know i'm, I'm just a little guy <laughs> no, I, I agree with you um, about being transformed. Roman, Romans 12, 2, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as we renew our mind, well, yeah, we are going to continue to be transformed. Our, our life is going to start to reflect more of, of Christ's character as we renew our mind. Yeah, and, and I, I know some do refer to that as sanctification. Um I, I guess yeah, I guess you could say that. That's it's I you could say that's a part of sanctification because by definition, sanctification to be sanctified means you've been set apart, you've been declared holy. So as far as the scriptures go, sanctification, we have been set apart one time. 
Now, growing in that, being transformed, living that out, living a sanctified life, I, I can agree with that, that that part is a process. But as far as being uh, sanctified, that happens the moment we put our faith in Christ and he sets us apart. We he's He calls us a saint. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart. He declares us holy. And then we grow in that. We continue to, to, to be transformed as we renew our minds. And I, I, and I know that's at odds with there, there are many of those say sanctification is a process and maybe it's just a matter of semantics. Um, as far as, you know, growing in holiness. Yeah. I guess you could call it the same thing, growing in holiness, sanctification process. Um, but, you know, we don't become a saint. We, we are a saint. We're called a saint. I guess is the point I'm I'm trying to make here that I think is the point that Paul is making because because he you know, if you look at his his epistles many of them he he says I'm writing to the saints I'm writing to the saints at Corinth you've been called a saint and I, and I think that's important for our identity in Christ you know, if I I know it's common for us to say oh I'm just a sinner saved by grace which is true. We were sinners. We were saved by grace. But if I still see myself as a sinner, that's going to be the, I'm going to tend to live like a sinner. But if I see myself as a saint, I'm going to tend to live like a saint. You know, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So I think that's why Paul addresses all his letters to the saints, because he wants us to know that we are saints we're called saints god has set us apart he's declared us to be holy and so he wants us to live like that live like a saint live like a child of god i don't know does that make any sense rob you you unmuted you were going to share something oh i'm too confused oh all right sorry <laughs> <laughs> i just yeah it just so i'm just going to share per this is me personally this okay. is just it, it to me it cheapens it you know if we're all saints mm -hmm. you know that means supposedly jeffrey dahmer who received christ before he was killed you know he came to christ that we're calling him a saint because he received you know to me calling everybody that believes a saint it just cheapens the term for me but if that's biblical then who cares how I feel about it? You know, it's just, that's the way it is. Does so. it? Yeah. If, if, if we're basing it on our behavior, then yeah, I see, I get your point, but if we're basing it on the work of Christ, Hebrews 10, 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. We're not a saint because our behavior is perfect. Okay. We're a saint because Christ's sacrifice was perfect. So you can fall in and out of sainthood then because somebody that's called, they can backslide and they can reject Christ and then they can change their mind again and say, you know, like I think of some several, well, not several, but I'm thinking of one or two famous pastors that have gone through that. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess you can just the same way, you know, and, I don't know, unless you say to yourself, well, they were never really saved or else they wouldn't have been able to do that in the first place. Yeah. I mean, there's a, depends how you look at it, I guess. Yeah. There's different way, different views on that. Um, yeah. And, you know, we don't know what's going on in a person's heart. If they're, if they're saying, you know, it, it's certainly possible for a believer to fall into sin. I think we all agree with that. Um, is it possible for a person to, a, a child of God to renounce the faith and then come back. I don't know. You could, you could use Hebrews six to say, no, it's not possible for a person to do that. I don't know. It, you know, what it comes down to is we don't know what someone's heart, whether they were truly in, you know, indwelt by the Holy spirit mm -hmm. or if they just had an intellectual belief and we're going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could argue that all day, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts, Mark? I saw you unmuted. Uh, I was thinking of um, when we were talking about the Holy One uh, in Exodus and, well, you know, going back to the Old Testament, right? The God uh, 
chose his people and set them apart uh, yeah. from the rest of humanity. Uh, so that's what I think about when I, uh, I think about saints, about the holy, you know, the, the word saint means holy ones. Yeah. Uh, so he, uh, God has, uh, uh, has chosen uh, individuals uh, out of this world to be holy. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, is, Israel's a good example. They're God's chosen people. He he chose he chose them to be holy, to be different. They didn't always act any different, did they? A lot of times they acted just like the world. Remember, they said we want a king just like everybody else. So that that's a good point. Um, but yet they remained His chosen people. They they were disciplined. And God will do that with his children today. Hebrews 12, he'll discipline us if we if we do, if we, you know, get into a pattern where we're we're not uh we're living, you know, destructive lives, he'll discipline us. We don't cease being his child. But if we're not receiving discipline, then we we're, it's because we're not his child his child, he says in Hebrews 12. So and look how many how often he had to discipline Israel. They're his chosen people. He constantly had to discipline the, Daniel, the Babylonian captivity. That was discipline. That, that's the reason for that whole Babylonian captivity. So, yeah. So I, I think uh, the word saint. I think if we, the human, the human, and uh, we've hijacked the, the name saint is what I'm yeah. trying to say. Here. Yeah. If we get back to the biblical what God intended for the word saint, then I think Paul is, is right. I mean, calling, calling the, the saved members in Ephesus, uh, or, um, well, in, you know, in our text here, when he's calling them saints, he was reflecting what, how God looks at the saved people. Right. Amen. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, we have kind of hijacked that term, haven't we? Yeah. I, I think so. Yeah. All right. Rob's giving us a thumb, giving you a thumbs up, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Good. Good insight, Mark. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Hayne, do you have any thoughts on that? No? Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, yeah, so to be a saint or to be a holy one is to be set apart for God's purposes. So what? So what's the purpose that he set us apart for? A um, couple things. He, use, one is to, he set us apart to proclaim the gospel, right? Um, Matthew 28, to go out and make disciples. Go ahead, Rob. No, I was just agreeing. Spread the word. That was... Yeah. Yeah, spread the word. Mark 16, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Um, he set us apart to use our spiritual gifts that he's given us to, in order to edify the body of Christ. So we're to build up one another. And part of that is sharing the gospel. So if you're sharing the gospel with the lost, they become saved. That builds up the body of Christ. And then those that are believers were to use our gifts to, to build that, them up, to equip them for the work of ministry, to, to encourage one another. Go ahead, Jeff. Do you have something to add? I was just going to say, you know, the Westminster Shorter Catechism would say that our purpose is mm. to glorify God and to enjoy fellowship with him forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Glorify God. So everything we do should be to glorify God. And, and of course that includes, you know, sharing the gospel that certainly glorifies God, uh, love, loving one another, loving the brethren. That's going to glorify God. Um, building up the body of Christ. That's glorifying God, um, forgiving others. Uh, that, that glorifies God because that's something that's, that is so contrary to human nature, just forgiving someone and that can open the door to sharing the reason for our hope. You know, how can you forgive someone that did that heinous committed that heinous act? Well, God forgave me. So that's why I can forgive others. So. Amen. All right. So, yeah. So our purpose 
yeah, our primary purpose is to glorify God and there's everything we do can be a, a way to glorify God. I can glorify God while I'm washing dishes or scrubbing toilets. Yeah. It ain't about me, is it? Amen. Amen. Yep. It's not about me at all. Good point. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. It's all about Jesus. All about bringing glory to the Father. All right. That's verse uh, six and seven. And on verse six there, he talks about grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever notice how many, how often Paul talks about grace and peace? And and so often he links them together, especially in his usually at the beginning and end of his of his epistles, grace and peace to you. And and and, and interesting that it's that he says it's from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's okay. All right, see you, Rob. All right. But anyway, it's interesting how he he always makes sure it's that that we know that that grace and peace comes from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's he is God is the source of grace, and he's he's really the only source of true peace as well. Remember, Jesus said in me, He says, "You have peace." He said, "I I give you peace, not as the world gives you peace." Uh, the world's peace is certainly different than the peace that Christ gives us. The world's definition of peace is when everything is calm, there's no conflict. Jesus's peace is in the midst of conflict, in the midst of turmoil, we can still have peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Uh, that's probably a good place to stop so we can have time to, to pray. Do you have any other insights to share, Jeff? Just the one thing is, it's interesting that when we write a letter, an epistle, today we always kind of sign it at the end, right? right. And at the beginning, um, it's typical, I guess, in, in New Testament times that they introduce themselves in the beginning and then greet everyone at the end, you mm -hmm. know, which is, which is kind of the reverse of what we do. But he seems to have spent a particularly a lot of a lot more time introducing himself. So I gather that he didn't know the Romans at the time when he wrote this. Mm -hmm. And so if you're writing to total strangers, you probably need to emphasize who you are and what your authority is mm -hmm. more so in the beginning. Hmm. Good point. And I think if I recall when he closed the letter, I think he did something extensive like that as well, didn't he? Um, yeah, because he talks about all these greeting all these people, Rufus, Leg uh, Hermes, etc. So that that supports what you said too, that he probably didn't he may have never met them, but apparently they they knew some of the same people. So yeah, good point, Jeff. Thank you. And he didn't start out there, Rufus, did he? Right, right. <laughs> All right. Anybody have any additional insights to share? Yeah, what's our what's our big lesson for today? Seemed like the one big thing we go ahead, Jeff. We're we're called to Mark. share. That's yeah. Uh, Amen. Sorry if I stepped on something. Yeah. No, go ahead, Mark. Share. We're called to share his, the word. Amen. Amen. That's, called why, to share. We're, that's why we're saved uh, and set apart. Amen. Amen. Saved and set apart to, to share the word. Yeah, because think about it. If, if the only purpose was to get saved, God certainly could have just taken us straight to heaven as soon as he saved us, but he, he left us here to, to share the word with others. Once to, we've got a Got a purpose. So thank, thank you, Mark. Jeff, what are your thoughts? Well, it's just interesting to me how he identifies in verse four both the earthly lineage mm. of um, Jesus Christ and David, yeah. and then uh, identifies, however, he was declared to be the Son of God mm. by being raised from the dead, and that's not that's not something that I thought about. But as I look through scripture, I see that it's kind of a common theme that uh, Jesus is known to be the son of God because God raised him from the dead. 
you mm. know, which is not something that happens to us except mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ, you know. Amen. But to other men and women, no. So that that's kind of profound to me. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Dean, do you have anything to add? No. All right. Anybody like to pray for us? Jeff, would you yeah. mind praying for us? Yeah, not at all. Thank Heavenly you. Father, we just thank you for your grace and mercy to all of us because we were sinners. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has sinned mm -hmm. and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet you chose us out of this world mm -hmm. to see the truth and to be sanctified, to be justified, to be sanctified, and to be glorified. Mm -hmm. And I I pray that the meaning of all three of these words would become clear mm -hmm. as we proceed with this study. Thank you so much for Jim's willingness to lead the study. May you bless him and um, enlighten him as we go through it and enlighten all of us mm -hmm. so that we can come to appreciate the truth of your son, Jesus Christ, and how we can best serve him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Amen. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Heen. Thank you. Yep. All right. We all have a have a blessed rest of the week and uh, fulfill the purpose that God set you apart for. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. We'll see y'all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.